Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to ARC 409. I am Bill Jacoby, Senior Solutions Architect, Amazon Web Services. We are going to cover a very exciting topic. We are going to cover how to run Windows workloads and specifically Microsoft servers on AWS at scale. So I've got a lot of content and therefore I'm going to jump right in. Um, I'm not terribly blinded, so I probably will not fall off the stage. What to expect from this session? Uh, we're gonna talk about a push button automated solution that, that stands up the Microsoft servers uh, with scaling to 100K. I'll show you the scaling. We'll talk about how to build, load test, and display the metrics of a complex Windows stack, uh, uh, a, a multi-template uh, Windows stack. You should have general familiar, just by show of hands, how many people have familiarity with the Microsoft servers? Um, I think that's everybody in the room, so that's good to hear. How many of you have familiarity with AWS? Excellent, okay. So none of this will really be 100, 200. Um, this will be the real deal. I'm gonna talk about uh, EC2 Windows, bootstrapping, elastic load balancing, cloud formation, a lot on cloud formation, elastic beanstalk, elastic search, um, code commit, and direct connect for connecting to a, an on-premises location. My quick uh, agenda, in general, this presentation goes from sort of top level to increasing level, levels of details. And uh, you can see the agenda here, so let's, um, let's jump right in. So the first question is, I just wanted to start off with a question so it doesn't become the first question when I'm all done. Why, why on earth would anybody wanna run the Microsoft servers on AWS? And the, the reason basically comes down to a handful of reasons that are all important. Um, the first one is that we're essentially running on-premises software on AWS. As a result of that, we can run customizations. If you customize the master page in SharePoint, if you loaded IS, ISV applications on the Microsoft servers, um, K2 for workflow, uh, Nintex, um, uh, any, any uh, meta, Metalogics, um, Contently. There are thousands of SharePoint and Exchange and Skype for Business add-ons. If they run on premises, the odds are 99% that they'll run on, on AWS. Second reason, and this is something that you'll really see in this session, a lot of work has, I, I personally and a lot of other Amazon employees have put a lot of work into automating the provisioning of, of Microsoft servers. So what that means is you'll see the technologies between CloudFormation, uh, PowerShell, and, uh, uh, and, and integrating a whole set of Amazon building blocks into these basically push button solutions. The DevOps story of AWS and being able to store infrastructure as code is, is really powerful. And being able to use uh, a, uh, uh, code commit as a GitHub repository and being able to use um, the, the entire CI CD story for Windows, um, which is discussed in a, in, a, in a related session to mine. Optimization, so optimization is really important. When you're running servers, uh, I'm gonna show you how you have access to a whole set of metrics, not only at the AWS level, but also at the Microsoft level. And whatever set of logs you have, we can turn into uh, cloud log watch uh, metrics and, and we can then act on, on those metrics. Depth and breadth of services, this is actually my favorite one. I'm gonna show you an example of a hybrid solution where I'm running OSS software, open, open source software, alongside the Microsoft stack. And the combination and the kinds of creative solutions you can come up with are really interesting and innovative when you start to say, for in, in my case here, I'm gonna use a load tester uh, a, a load test, a locust load tester um, in the Microsoft world, in the Windows world. So there's a tremendous depth and breadth out of the ecosystems as well as just a tremendous breadth of AWS services. Auditability, I believe, is better in the cloud than on-premises. And as you can see in my slide here, we can audit everything. We can audit every network packet, every EC2 API call. 
We can audit um, all permissions. Um, we can audit essentially anything that changes in the environment. And it, it's not really part of this session, but you can also control permissions and policies to enable who's allowed to do exactly what. Um, license management is uniquely important in the Microsoft world because you've got to remain compliant with Microsoft. And so we have tools in the cloud, AWS Config, which will specifically monitor, are you in license compliance? Um, are server-bound licenses always attached to servers across reboots, across failures, et cetera, et cetera? And if you like, at the end, I can talk about, well, what happens if a server-bound license is attached to a server uh, that fails? Um, so we have answers to all the sort of edge cases. And lastly, enabled for compliance. And this is, I come from, I'm part of worldwide public sector team out of Washington, D.C., where FedRAMP and FISMA and compliance in general is super important. Compliance is also obviously important for healthcare and HIPAA. Compliance is important in financial services industries. So we have a whole set of accelerators or quick starts that you can treat as a sandbox and launch what I'm going to show you here in the, in the PCI sandbox or in the uh, NIST 800-53 sandbox or in, the, or in the FISMA high or FISMA medium sandbox and you'll have a solution that's certifiably or certified to be compliant up through the infrastructure stack. So the whole compliance conversation is, much, is, is a yet another conversation that there's probably multiple sessions on here at reInvent. However, the fact that we give you a head start by giving you these uh, compliance sandboxes, um, these are all great, and you obviously don't get that on premises. So these are all, these are sort of the handful of reasons uh, why we think running Windows on AWS makes sense. We think that we're super high performance, great DevOps capabilities that'll let you create push button solutions, um, you can create unique, innovative solutions out of the depth and breadth of services from the ecosystems. And so, you know, let me just sort of uh, start with that point and, and move from there. Uh, next, I just want to say that what I'm going to show you, uh, what I, what I and a, and a co-author built, and what I'm going to show you is based on our actual migration to the Microsoft servers in Amazon. So as you can see on the slide here, in 2013, we made a decision to move, to, to move the entire Microsoft stack to running on AWS. 200,000 Amazon users using, a, a, as you can see, Exchange, SharePoint, and Link on a, on a golden image that our global IT group created. And if you use Exchange as sort of a data point, the, the diagram on the right is a little bit hard to read, but we've got two regions in the US, US East 1 and US West 2, so we're running uh, half of our email out of, the, out of two U.S. regions. Um, there's a third U.S. region that just opened, um, U.S. East 2 out of, out of Ohio, but we're running on U.S. East 1, U.S. East 2, and for our uh, non-U.S. Amazon employees, we have um, a region in, we, we run Exchange in, um, in China, and we run Exchange in, um, in EU West in Dublin. And so, uh, so this is just, an, I, I'm putting this up here just to say that what I'm about to show you is not just a toy quick start, but it's based on, it's based on what really works. Um, we also have a separate talk on exactly what we've done and how we've done it. I, I guess I want to make an additional point. I don't know if it's on this slide. Um, maybe I'll make it on this slide. So, so all, of you in, all of you who have experience in the Microsoft world I just want to point out that Microsoft has capacity calculators for all their servers. So for example, in the case of Exchange, what do you, how do you know that your Exchange architecture is a valid architecture, is a supportable architecture, or a, um, a, a preferred architecture, using the Microsoft term, a PA architecture, and not just a bunch of servers that somebody stood up? So the way you know is Microsoft provides capacity calculators for all their servers. In the case of Exchange, uh, the calculator, which just runs in Excel, will ask you how many users do you have, what size mailboxes do you have, how many email messages are sent um, on average. Um, of, the, of, of the, let's say, 100 email messages that are sent a day, how many have attachments? If, say, 10% have attachments, what is the average attachment size? If it's one one megabyte, 
if, if you put all those inputs into the exchange capacity calculator, it'll spit out, this is what you need to have a supportable exchange environment. So these capacity calculators were the starting point for everything that we've built in the quick start that I'll show you here today. Um, so that we always are meeting and exceeding the minimum requirements that Microsoft mandates for a supportable environment. I'm not gonna get into licensing or support in, in this session, except to say that we have a great relationship with Microsoft. Um, it, it's really co-opetition, but a, but a great relationship at a support level in which um, a customer can call Microsoft and get support on AWS, and a customer on AWS, can, uh, the same customer could call AWS and our TAMs, our technical account managers, can loop in the Microsoft support folks for a solution on AWS. Okay, so there's mutual agreement and there's strong uh, support uh, between the two companies. So, so what is this thing that I wanna uh, show you and that I'm proposing is a, is a, is a one start, uh, a push button automated solution for uh, the Microsoft servers? It's the it's what we call the quick start or enterprise accelerator for Microsoft servers in the AWS cloud. And when you get my slides, if you download these slides, you'll see that the description of what this is is on the quick start page. It's standing up all the Microsoft servers in a single VPC. I'll, I'll show you that in a second. It's a cloud formation template to fully automate. It's a one push button to get all these servers, Exchange, SharePoint, um, link, um, Active Directory, SQL Server, all of those servers provisioned in a, in a single VPC that spans availability zones for high availability. And we've turned on all the high availability features of the Microsoft servers, we've, which really mean, I'll get into that more, more as I go on. And we also take advantage of multiple availability zones in the Amazon world for, for HA. So the, so the thing I'm gonna be showing you is, is exactly what you see on this screen here, the quick start or accelerator for Microsoft servers. Okay, so what is the infrastructure? Um, like I just said, the, the infrastructure is a single VPC that spans um, at, at least two availability zones. We, we use multiple availability zones for high availability and, uh, and I, I've set up a, a demilitarized zone subnet for management. Um, this demilitarized zone that you see here can be either on the public internet or where you see the users listed here, that can be a corporate data center. And instead of using an IGW, I can use a VGW to connect to on-premises users. So this is not, don't, don't read this as necessarily a public subnet attached to the internet. This is really two management subnets that you're either accessing from your corporate data center or accessing from the internet. Um, you know, simply switching out an internet gateway for a, a virtual gateway, a VGW, and then it's 100% and you know, 100% uh, corporate solution. Um, I've got security groups for all the server roles. So security groups provide the, the port and protocol uh, firewalls for each one of the server roles. It's different for each server. The ports and protocols that, that AD uses, the multiplicity of, of ports and protocols that are required, including TCP and UDP and DNS and all this stuff. You know, the ports and protocols that need to be open for each Microsoft server are obviously different. And uh, by using security groups for each role, we, we provide an instance level firewall for each of the servers. In addition, we provide network ACLs for, um, for the private subnets here so that if any protocol tries to enter the private subnets that's not supported, that, that, that's not supported or required by the servers, we have a stateless firewall, these, these NACLs, and the stateful firewalls, the, the security groups. We have, um, this is a very interesting, so uh, uh, we have two Active Directory sites, um, two Active Directory sites mapped to the two availability zones for high availability. And what's interesting here, and this is a general point to make, uh, Active Directory sites, uh, 
all Microsoft servers, whether it's Active Directory sites or, uh, or any Microsoft server doesn't, isn't aware of an availability zone, the Microsoft servers are available as, are, are aware of subnets. And so when I set up the Microsoft servers, what I've configured them to do is to have servers in different subnets and it's VPC that maps those subnets to different availability zones. So we get this availability zone construct in a sense for free when I configure the Microsoft servers by pointing to subnets that just happen to be defined in these two different availability zones. So there's no, there are no shims or there's no, there's no magic to, to deploying the Microsoft servers in Amazon I just simply use subnets which happen to be mapped to the different availability zones and that gives us the, that gives us the redundancy that multi-availability zone, uh, availability zone provides. And from, a, from an application perspective, it just thinks that a subnet is a, is a subnet is a subnet. I'll talk about latency a little bit later in the session and I'll, I'll show you some examples of latency. So um, I'm using, uh, if you, did anybody hear me speak in Washington, D.C. six months ago? I don't, I don't know if any of you are from D.C. So six months ago, I showed some of the things I'm gonna show here today, but I use live real clients. Um, one of the common pieces of feedback six months ago was it would, it would be really interesting if you showed me the entire Microsoft story with VDI or hosted desktops, and so that's what I'm doing here. You're gonna see my, my clients will be uh, Amazon Workspaces. And for those of you who are uh, fans or customers of Citrix, uh, Citrix and Amazon have a good relationship and uh, Zen Desktop and Zen App also are supported by Citrix on AWS. I'm, I'm gonna show you Amazon Workspaces, but we, we have many customers who are, who are running what I'm gonna show you using, using um, Zen Desktop. Okay. And lastly, and I've, as I've mentioned, uh, instead of going through the internet gateway, we could connect directly to on-premise through VPN or, or direct connect. So this is the basic Amazon architecture. And the Microsoft topologies, I won't go into depth on this. Um, if you've been to any Microsoft conferences, there are entire sessions on some of the line items that I just call out in a single bullet point. So we, we support, for example, database availability groups for Exchange, the standard Exchange application level, high availability technology. I'm using linked paired pools. I'm using SQL Server always on for SharePoint. Um, that's, that's the gold standard for high availability between SQL Server. That means that each SQL Server instance has actually three IP addresses. Um, in this session, I'm not gonna go into the details on how uh, Always On works, but, we're, but I've employed SQL Server high availability. Th this next bullet is really sort of the, the money bullet in my point, this brick architecture. So over the last, I don't know, five or six years, Microsoft has been moving towards this concept of multi-role servers in which a server contains all the roles. Instead of Exchange, having a separate mailbox server and a separate CAS server and a separate transport server and a, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Microsoft is moving for all the servers towards these multi-role servers, which is an architecture that, that I, I happen to really like because what it means is that you can scale out horizontally with these multi-role servers. So you're gonna see that the way that I've scaled out SharePoint is by taking the SharePoint servers that you see here and, um, and I'm gonna scale them out so that I have 10 SharePoint app servers. Um, I'm also gonna show you, um, so I've mentioned that we started with the capacity calculators and I'm gonna use load testing. I'm gonna use um, Locust and the Elk stack to show you, um, to prove to you that we're supporting 100,000 users. Okay, um, now when you run the quick start, when you look at that, um, when you look at that uh, Microsoft servers, quick start or accelerator, and you run the whole thing, this is what the end result is. It may be hard to read from where you're sitting. Um, these servers were stood up in June. Actually, the servers I'm gonna demonstrate for you were just set up last week. And the basic um, quick start sets up these four, 14 servers. So I just want you to see sort of the end, end result there. 
And what I'd like to do next is, is go into just a quick demo just to prove that the whole thing works. So I'm gonna show you the clients and I'm gonna show you um, the servers. And um, I think from this machine I can do, I can do all, the, all the demos. So let us jump in here and jump into Amazon Workspaces and jump into another Amazon Workspace. And uh, let's see, let me just see which user. Okay, and let's see, I've got my slides in the background. Um, So, uh, oh, this is my Windows 10 workspace. I'm gonna show that in, in just a minute. But let's start off with my Windows 7 workspace. Okay, so what you're seeing here, it's a little bit squishy because I'm showing you two full desktops out of Amazon workspaces on the same machine. And over here, I've got a user named Kelvin Jacobs. And uh, in the case of Kelvin, I'm gonna make this a tiny bit wider. I am going to, uh, we're going to email the gentleman on the left named uh, B. Jacobs and just say to B, to Bethany. Um, you'll notice presence is integrated because all the servers run in the same VPC. We have 100,000 users, so I'm gonna just grab some random users here and doesn't really matter which ones I pick. I, do, I mostly just want you to see, I, I'm gonna show you Active Directory in a second, but I just want you to see that there are, uh, what is the technical term for a significant amount of users without referring to a, to a body part on my back? Um, don't, don't, don't get me in trouble, guys. Uh, so this is just gonna be, um, have you seen the latest Gartner report on electric vehicles? And I'm gonna send it to all these people, including this user, uh, Bethany Beth, on the, on the left side. So let me, hit, let me hit send. Okay, and... Uh, so as you notice over here, the email came across. Um, nothing earth shattering, this is what you do every day. I'm just trying to prove that all functionality works. Um, I, I guess if I look at the email that I just received, the uh, presence will tell me that Calvin Hobbs, that uh, presence will tell me that this, uh, that Calvin over here is online because of the green presence symbol. So I'm gonna go ahead and I am, uh, just to show you, link and Skype. Um, hi, Calvin. Are you enjoying reInvent? Hope you didn't imbibe too much. Okay, and there we get the uh, link symbol. And um, no, I've been nose to the grindstone, only learning. And I'm gonna get into all the servers and all that stuff. So if you're looking at this thinking, yeah, this is old hat, don't, don't, don't worry about that. So that's two. And then the third one that I wanted to show you is the SharePoint server. So, uh, let, let's just say, uh, have you seen the, the latest um, information on, on EVs? Uh, I want to show it to you. Show it to you, if not. Okay. And um, so now let's go to SharePoint. And I've got a number of SharePoint sites that are, that are set up here. 
And again, this is sort of garden variety, but I'm gonna go into all the servers and everything in, in just a second, just to sort of make the point that everything is, is actually working. And um, so SharePoint, SharePoint works, and um, I think I have another site sitting at, I've got a blog. This is actually what I wanted to send a link for. And I also, by the way, have a, have a team site. Um, if I go to SharePoint app, uh, sites, uh, it's not called team, it's called doc library. So, you know, not, you know, so let's send, so SharePoint looks like it's okay. We'll send the link, we'll send the, the no pun intended, we'll send the link through link. Um, we'll send the link through link. And uh, where, did, where did my link session go? I think I'm talking to Bethany over here. Oh, there it is, okay. Here, oh, I'm sending it to the wrong, it does, doesn't really matter. Um, uh, Kelvin is saying go for it, okay, so Bethany's gonna send, boom. Okay, and if I click on it over here, then the same SharePoint site goes ahead and, okay, so all client functionality, I probably spent too much time, all client functionality works, it's integrated, things like presence are integrated, email is integrated, um, everything's integrated because we're running everything basically not only in the same VPC, but in the same subnets, um, et cetera, et cetera. So now let, let's peel the onion back a, a layer deeper and talk a, bit about, talk a bit about the servers. Okay, so let's see. So the first thing when you think about the Microsoft servers is usually Active Directory. So I have, um, so let's um, remote in. Okay, this uh, looks to me like our remote desktop gateway and I've got a handy dandy tool that I'd recommend to everybody called Remote Desktop Connection Manager. If you haven't used this tool, it's a, it's a consider this a pro tip. Um, this allows me to see, this allows me to create a tree of all the servers in my infrastructure and with just a single click, I can jump to my domain controller one and my link front end uh, server one and my SharePoint search server one and my uh, SQL search, you know, all, all the servers that make up, that make up my environment. So, uh, so first things first, I actually want to, let's make this full screen. So let's go into Active Directory. Uh, let's make sure I'm actually in the, let's make sure I'm actually in the, in the domain controller, uh, uh, domain controller one. Okay, that's good. Uh, hello. Okay, let. I, I'm already. I'm, I'm double RDP'd, which is why I had to do that. Active Directory users and computers. A duck. We'll go into there. First thing I want you to notice is that ADUC reports the fact, you probably can't read this, there's 102,686 items um, of users, 102,000 users. I'll show you this in PowerShell in just a minute. So this is a really, you know, by most standards, this is really big. And, um, and it's just regular AD. So I can, pick any, I can pick any user here. I can pick, for example, um, I can pick, uh, myself, um, I'm a user, um, all the typical information. Um, okay, so that's, that's AD. I guess I wanted to do one other quick thing with AD. What I wanna do is, um, what I wanna do here is, is within PowerShell, uh, let me see how much, uh, how much PowerShell I remember. I want to do um, get ad uh, user 
tab minus filter star. So these are my users in the directory. I'm not gonna make you sit here for 45 minutes and look at 100,000 users. So let's be a little bit smarter. And, uh, and uh, let's take that same command and suffix it with dot count. And let's add a leading paren. And now I'm actually enumerating every user in the directory and we should get up about that same 100,000 figure. Um, when I did this testing a few minutes ago, it was actually, I think, 108,000. It's, it's taking a lot, if you look carefully, it's saying that it's running the script. It takes a long time to count 100,000 users. So I'm gonna leave this here. We may come back to it because I wanna just sort of keep, keep, the trains on, keep the trains on time. So remind me to come back to this. And I wanna jump into the other servers just to show them to you quickly. So um, let's see here. Where is, um, remote, where's my connection manager? Okay, and uh, I wanna jump in, I just wanna show you that all this stuff is, is working. So in the case of Exchange, this is EAC, Exchange Admin Manager. Um, there's n not, nothing to really show you. I can say, um, I, I can say, show me, show me, um, uh, you know, show me that user named B Jacoby in the directory. There, there I am. Here's my mailbox information. And just like normal Exchange, I can look at my mailbox, my name, my X.500 address. Um, the mailbox features that I've got turned on, do I have a delegate for my mailbox, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So again, this isn't a Microsoft session. I'm gonna sort of, uh, and also the same, a lot of the information's on the right. So boom, Exchange appears to work. Let's take a look at my link front end server. I've got a link front end one and front end two. And in the case of link, again, let's make it full screen. And uh, link is full screen, and let's take a look at link. And we'll point at the front end one. Okay, and so here's link, and I can look at users. And I don't wanna enumerate. Enumerating 100,000 users is, is always a painful thing. So let's just look at 100 users at a time, and let's just say find, find all users. Okay, so here are the first 100 users or so that I've got link enabled. And if I click on any one of them, I, this gentleman named Albert Lowe, again, just like in the case of Exchange, I can see all the information about link. I can look at the link topology. I didn't show this to you in Exchange. I've got two front end servers, which are in two different availability zones. I've done the same for Exchange and, and much more for SharePoint. I can look at things like monitoring. I'm monitoring uh, what's going on here. Um, I, can, um, I can monitor call detailed records for every communication that happens. So I hope that in just like the last few minutes I've convinced you, oh, I wanted to go back to the domain controller to show you that there really are 100,000 users. So domain controller one, this thing finally finished. Um, boom, 108,035 users in Active Directory. So now the next thing I wanna do is just prove that this is a super scalable architecture that I've, that I've laid out, okay? So we're gonna, uh, so I'm gonna sort of stop this part of, of the demo and um, what is, uh, is it I wanna do? What I would like to do is um, I am going to show you, so actually it won't, I'm gonna explain what I did. I'm gonna show you the slides and then I'm gonna show you how I did it. So you, you saw the server, let's go to full screen. You saw the servers, you saw the client demo, Amazon Workspaces. Oh, I, I just flashed it, but um, I do want you to uh, be aware that we also support, um, that we also support uh, Windows 10 Workspaces. So over here, um, I actually set up the same thing using Windows 10 as well. 
So if I wanted to, you know, so if you're thinking about, well, I'm thinking about moving to Windows 10, um, you can deploy this on Windows 7, which I've been showing, or um, as you can see here, Windows, Windows 10. And for the, uh, you know, I can go into like the same demo, but it, it's, trust me, every, everything works just fine on, on Windows 10. So going back to my slides, uh, so you've seen the, the uh, you've seen the client demo in workspaces. Um, oh, I happen to, I've only enabled about 15 workspaces users. However, there's another session going on that talks about how do you provision, for example, 100,000 workspace users. I did it the manual way. I just clicked on, you know, like 10 or 12 or, or, or so. But you can script out scheduling or de de uh, provisioning 100,000 workspaces um, all at once. You need to work with us for that many workspaces, but we can absolutely help you do it. Um, by the way, I just highlighted in red here that some of these workspaces have a GPU attached to it. My, my workspace has a GPU. And um, this uh, Andrea Crass woman happens to uh, be running Windows 10. So just pointing out some details about the client. Okay, you saw the server demo, um, everything uh, worked. So next topic is load testing. You know, can the Amazon infrastructure really support 100,000 users? And uh, the answer is yes. I'm gonna come back in a minute to the instance sizes and things like that that I picked. But the way I wanted to test how uh, robust, how scalable my environment is, is I'm using this third-party locust uh, that, I shouldn't say third party, this open source locust tool, which works the way it's uh, lit, described in this uh, slide, in which I have a master and I have um, uh, eight or nine or 10 locust workers that are spawned that hit the um, elastic load balancer, then in turn hit, my, hit all my SharePoint servers. Okay, and so this is, um, and if you want to learn more about Locust, you, there's a link in my, in my URL for uh, learning, learning about Locust. Um, the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to show you that using what's called the Elk stack, um, I'm doing log ag aggregation. So I'm using Logstash to crawl the IIS log directories and take each log entry for IIS and store it in Elasticsearch. Elasticsearch acts as essentially a database, and it allows me to do queries against the database. Kibana is my visualization dashboard that also supports queries against the Elasticsearch database. And when I combine um, all three products, what it'll you know, so what I'm doing here is I'm using log I'm using Logstash on each one of the uh, on each one of the servers, which is shipping the logs to an indexer, each log stash uh, instance it holds a little database, and then it sends that database to Elasticsearch. Elasticsearch aggregates all the essentially called detail records, all the, all the IIS weblog records, and then I'm gonna visualize it in this tool called Kibana, this sort of tool that lets me build dashboards very quickly and easily. And the reason for this is I'm gonna start pounding on my SharePoint infrastructure and visualizing it in Kibana. So we'll have an end result sort of like this. And let me, let me go to the, uh, let, me, let me actually do, do what I just now said I was gonna do. So let's go to Chrome and let's go to Locust. Okay, and currently I'm stopped. Um, no, currently I have 15, this is a, not, not really a good term, but I have 15 uh, scale out locust workers that are putting load on my, on my uh, SharePoint environment. I'm gonna, I actually wanna show you something. I wanna show you where they're hitting SharePoint. So if I go to, let, let's go to Cloud Lab 8. And let me show you my load balancer. So, so here is my load balancer. It's, um, it, 
it, it's got a DNS name here. Uh, it's easier to grab it from down here. And this will distribute traffic across all my SharePoint servers. How many SharePoint servers do I have? Like I mentioned, the quick start gives you the template, gives you, you know, the, 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 the meat of the solution, and then we can um, add to that. So what am I looking to do? I'm looking to look at instances for SharePoint. And what I want you to see is that I've got a SharePoint web front end, two, two, two SharePoint web front ends, and I've got um, SharePoint App Server 9, SharePoint App Server 10, SharePoint App Server 2, SharePoint Distributed Cache 1, SharePoint App Server 1, SharePoint Search. These are the servers that essentially that make up, that make up the, um, the SharePoint architecture. What I've done is I've actually added to each of these roles, which are traditional roles in SharePoint, I've added the, I've added the SharePoint foundation role, which makes each of these servers a SharePoint web server, which will display a SharePoint web, which will host a SharePoint web app and will display a SharePoint site collection, like the blog and the, um, and the document library team site and the, and the SharePoint portal. So these, are the, so these servers are sort of playing dual purpose. They're a distributed cache and a web front end and a search server, but they're also, in a sense, pure web, app, web front end slash application servers serving load. So I've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten of these, and the, the ELB that I just showed you is going to point to each one of these. In fact, I should have shown you that. If I go to the ELB here, um, if I go to my ELB and show you the instances that it's sending traffic to, you can see all the servers that I, that I just mentioned, and they're all listed here as, as being in service. Okay, so from the internet, let's just go, let's just go to that endpoint, boom. Um, we're, they're all, they all default to the portal site. And I can hit refresh a million times here, but that's not really a scalability test. That's just how quickly can I press refresh. No big deal. Locust is a significant scale test. So let's point, let's um, go back to Locust. And what I'm gonna do here is stop it. I'll go to the dashboard in one second. So I've stopped Locust, and I'm gonna say, let's run a new load test. And I'm gonna jump right to, I'm gonna say, let's uh, simulate 5,000 users that are, uh, the hatch rate means how many new users am I spawning per second? So I'm gonna, I'm gonna add 160 users per second to SharePoint up until a maximum of 5,000 users through this scale-out architecture that I mentioned uh, with Locust. Um, so this will take a little while to spin up. There's 156 users, there's 471 users, 849 users. I hope you, I hope you can all see this. 14, 18 users, 18, 29 users, 2,000 users, um, we're getting 2,274 2, requests per second. So this, so this is Locust. And I, I should mention um, that Locust is being scaled. All those uh, eight worker or 10 worker nodes in Locust are actually being, uh, schedule, are, are, are being deployed using an ELB using Elastic Beanstalk. So if I load Elastic Beanstalk, what you'll see here is this is my Locust app, and Elastic Beanstalk is simply saying uh, to be the uh, mechanism for auto scaling, auto scaling my my environment. So I'm using Elastic Beanstalk. I'm using the load balancing service. I'm actually uh, what I discovered is that I actually only need four four instances, and for the sake of the demo, to avoid startup time. I have a min of four and a, and a max of four. Okay, and by the way, my slide has a blog posting that shows you how to set up Locust uh, inside of Elastic Beanstalk. 
So, um, so let's just let's just take a look at the at the SharePoint dashboard. And my dashboard, my Kibana dashboard, is right here. And let's take a look at what's happening. So th this is my dashboard. I want to I want to make sure that I have the latest data. So I'm going to say set to now and hit go. And so this is real time data. And just a few minutes ago, when I turned up the load to um, to 5,000 users with 166 hatches, you can see that the load immediately spiked. And you'll notice, by the way, that um, we've sent uh, 14,719,000 uh, uh, web requests. You know, you can you can see the web requests how they've sort of peaked out here at at the 5,000 users over the course of today. I've sent 312 million requests to SharePoint. Um, and you can also see the requests over time. Everything was sort of um, doing absolutely nothing until we got started. And then I had some sort of, I think I, I, think I had it running at a low level uh, before I came in here. I turned it off. And then when you guys saw me turn it on, you can see the immediate spike to over, to nearly 50 million Request per second. That, that's what you're seeing here as well. Um, 50 million aggregate requests per second. And so the idea here is that if you set, you know, the idea here is um, you're a large company, everybody shows up for work at 8 a.m., and between 8 a.m. and 9 a.m., 100,000 users are going to log on to the system, and we want SharePoint to support them all. And so this is sort of what my test is. Um, my uh, Kibana here will, will show me. Um, well, well over, well over 100,000 users um, per, per um, well over 100,000 users per, um, uh, per, per hour, this sort of like time period when I, when I first get started. And I, I, I can go back to my clock and say, let's update this to exactly right now. You'll also notice that the load balancer is, is almost evenly distributing load across the, across the different servers. Um, okay, so that, so let me hop back to my slides. So that's, you know, that, that, is, that is the doing load testing with Elastic Beanstalk, um, scaling out Locust servers, hitting the ELB, hitting the, the uh, 10 SharePoint servers, um, the Elk stack, aggregating the logs, Kibana displaying the logs, and now comes the really fun part. So how did I build all this? How do you build this Microsoft solution? So first of all, um, I, meant, I showed you the picture of the CloudFormation template that kicks this off. I, I built this whole solution out of CloudFormation. So I've, CloudFormation is our, is our uh, DevOps automation tool to automate uh, resources like the ones you see here. Um, uh, I have slipstreamed PowerShell into CloudFormation. I'll show you that in a second. And CloudFormation is very smart in the sense that I can run them, I can, I can provision a Microsoft server across multiple reboots, and CloudFormation knows how to pick up where it left off. Um, so let me sort of dive a little bit deeper. This is sort of, you know, so CloudFormation is the automation tool um, along with PowerShell. What's actually happening is I have six or seven stacks here. Um, I have a master stack that calls Active Directory. Um, Active Directory is a dependency for SQL. I, obviously, you can't kick off SQL until AD is running. Can't kick off Exchange until AD is running. You may not be so obvious. You can't kick off Link or Skype until Exchange is running because they both extend the AD schema. So if they were both running at the same time, there would be a collision between two servers that are both simultaneously trying to extend the AD schema. You can't run SharePoint until SQL is fully up and running because obviously SQL is a content database um, for, uh, SQL is a content database for SharePoint. So at this point, um, I wanna actually show you inside of CloudFormation, um, 
Uh, let's see, I don't think we're, let me just go to my dashboard and pick CloudFormation. Inside of CloudFormation, if I, so here's the one that I kicked off. This was actually kicked off on November 19th. And if I jump to my AD stack, I'll just use my AD stack as one example. Um, what I want to show you is if I, if I look under events, starting at the very beginning, the first thing, I, I kicked off the Microsoft server stack, it kicked off the AD stack, it kicked off the SQL stack, it kicked off the Exchange stack. Um, and I want to show you the actual AD stack, not the, not the master stack. Because within AD, AD is how, let me make this even bigger. Um, AD, the AD stack is what started, created the internet gateway, um, the elastic IP, it created the VPC, it created security groups, subnets, route tables. All the, all the Amazon infrastructure, you can see, you can see the date and the time and the exact resources that were created. You know, a lot of things happen when I stamp out this CloudFormation template. Um, I have a set of outputs from the CloudFormation template which become inputs to the next stack. So I run a stack and the outputs of one CloudFormation stack are the inputs to the next. So for example, most importantly, I pass the VPC ID between Active Directory to all the servers above it because, I, because I'm running them and deploying them all in the same VPC. Um, I, I can look at the, I'm gonna show you the, the template a, a little bit later. This is the JSON template. Um, and I have a set of outputs as well, uh, you know, this VPC, et cetera. Okay, so this is uh, the, this is the, the um, th this is really the cloud formation nested stacks that make up this infrastructure. I call this layer one, two, and three because these are all dependencies. You've got to do AD before you can do layer two. You've got to do the servers in layer two before you do layer three. Now, how did this work? How did I build this? The way I built it is I primarily took advantage of a statement called depends on. And so uh, resources are a, are a construct of cloud formation. All, all, all constructs in AWS um, are, are resources. And so the AD, AD stack, uh, or the SQL stack, I should say, has a dependency on the AD stack, which means AD stack will run. Without a depends on statement, all the stacks would run in parallel. So when this, this is my construct for saying, um, only run the SQL stack when the AD stack has completed. And so my master stack calls AD, which, um, and uh, the SQL stack in turn depends on, on AD. And these stacks create modularity, reuse, and resource ordering. I have a blog post that goes into a lot of detail on how, how this was built, but this is, this is just the dependency tree right here. Now the parameters, I have a whole set of parameters for filling this out, so if you run this, if you run this quick start, the idea is not that we're giving you like contoso.com. You could use this for your own company because although it's very hard to read on the slide, if I, if I zoom in a little bit, you can completely control, how do I scroll? You can completely control what is the CIDR range I wanna use, what are the subnets that I wanna use for my private subnets, um, I've got private subnets in availability zone one and private subnets in availability zone two. Um, what is the instance size I'm using for the remote desktop gateway? What is the, what is the name of the domain controller? It's, it happens to be DC1. What is the instance size? If I come over here, you have complete control over what is my, you know, everyone doesn't live by contoso.com. I'd be willing to bet um, that none of you come from a company called Contoso. So you can fill, you probably also don't come from a company called Example. But you can type in your, the DNS name of your company, your domain name, you can fill in the SQL Server configuration. We support SQL Server 2016. Um, since June, we support SQL Server 2016 on RDS. You know, you can fill in the SharePoint information. You know, where is the ISO that you wanna use? What is the product key you wanna use? Um, we supply all this information in the quick start the product keys are the, uh, the Microsoft trial keys. And the, the link configuration, do I want an edge 
Do I want to use an edge server, um, et, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So you have a huge amount of flexibility in, in running these quick starts. It's not just a, just a single you know, uh, fixed uh, demonstration. So to dive a little bit deeper um, into the cloud formation itself, I, when I'm creating the link front end, control, front end server, I just wanted you to note the way this actually works is there's a series of commands that you, that you tell CloudFormation to implement. And I, I believe my commands are, oh, I don't, I don't actually, I think the editors uh, got rid of my slide notes. But the, com, but, but the commands are, are things like, um, I think I, I don't know what I did here. But the command, this is just really weird. Why is this not displaying well? Let's move it back up. Okay, so the commands, so I, I really just want to show you that we're creating a, an instance, a server called link front end one, and within link front end one, I'm doing something like enable auto logon so that I don't have to manually enter a logon, and then I can do the installation. And the first thing I'm doing is setting up enable auto logon, and the next thing I'm doing way down here at the bottom is I'm saying, um, re, re, I'm saying restart my computer. And this is all PowerShell. So the ability to embed or slipstream PowerShell into CloudFormation is, is very powerful. Um, next, every time, it, it took me 100, 100 iterations to build this. And the thing is, infrastructure should be treated as code. And so I'm using um, AWS Code Commit, which is our enterprise GitHub repository um, that we provide. You can use GitHub, you can use, um, um, I'm, you, you can use um, TFS from Microsoft, TFS Enterprise. Uh, you can use any GitHub repository. And you can see I'm just using, you know, garden variety, you know, GitHub commands. Every time I have a change that I want to make, I'm making the change. I'm committing it to the staging area. I'm pushing it to the branch. Wor works as you would expect it to. Makes the whole development process of infrastructure Really, I'm employing software best practices for, de for debugging, creating, and, and building, building software. Okay, so um, this is the SharePoint architecture that I've, I've used, a little deeper diagram than what I showed you before. What I did is I took the, I, so in this case, I have four SharePoint servers. And what I did is I just added six more to have a total of 10 SharePoint servers behind the load balancer, which is what I uh, was, was uh, displaying with the dashboard. Now, a word about performance and latency. So before I do, um, I'm gonna try to do something really quick. So in terms of performance and latency, um, let me jump into, let me, it, I can do this from, from any one of my uh, uh, servers. So I'm in, I'm in, um, Availability Zone 1. I'm going to ping the Exchange 2 server in Availability Zone 2. And I want you to see that my latency is less than one millisecond between the facilities that make up an Availability Zone. These facilities may be separated by a two-digit number of miles. And with uh, single-mode fiber, we have, in all cases, you can test this yourself, we have, I, I, I guess I should be careful saying all, I believe in, in t do, do your own testing. We have like one millisecond latency between availability zones in our, in our different regions. If, if I want to ping, that's Exchange. If I want to ping um, the, the link front end to server in a different availability zone, same thing, less than one millisecond of, of uh, latency. If I want to ping um, my SQL server in the other availability group, um, Windows server um, failover cluster node two. I'm picking node two because it's in the other AZ. Sa same thing, for all my examples, I'm getting less than one millisecond. So that's why the solutions are so high performant. There's no latency. Part of the beauty of the Amazon architecture is there's, no, there's hardly any latency between availability zones. They give you site resiliency. And probably in a future talk, I'll talk about region uh, region resiliency and region failover and region and setting up, for example, multiple link pools in different regions. But I wanted to come back here to this point about um, performance and latency 
So I set this up in Washington, D.C. I set up my original clients in Washington, D.C., in Herndon, Virginia, and I'm connecting to U.S. West 2 in Portland, Oregon. And I want to point out here that if I connect over the Internet, if I do a, uh, if I do a, a trace route, uh, uh, if you can see right here, if I do a trace route to my domain controller 1, you can see all the hops that I've traversed, and I end up with 88 milliseconds round trip, which is pretty good. Microsoft advertises that link will work if your latency, if your latency from client to server is 120 milliseconds. I have an 88 millisecond round trip across the US, 2,000 miles plus from Washington DC to Oregon. I have an 88 millisecond round trip on the internet you know, using a VPN, and if I use Direct Connect, doing the exact same trace route to the exact same server IP address over Direct Connect, I have a 59 millisecond round trip. I am less than half of the Microsoft designated um, latency requirement for link with, with users and servers across the country. So if you extend this, in theory, I could double my distances. I could have a four. I could have four thousand miles between users on between users who are connecting over Direct Connect to a to an Amazon region, four thousand miles, and I'll still be within the the supported latency of Link, which is the most latency sensitive application from Microsoft. So I would I would I actually tell all my enterprise customers learn AWS, and the moment you want to start to do deployment. Please deploy, you know, think about deploying um, Direct Connect. Okay, and I believe this is my last slide, auditability. We think that auditability is this great um, advantage of the cloud. We can monitor e every API call through CloudTrail. Um, anything that an administrator does is, is timestamped. Uh, their name is recorded, the time is recorded, the EC2 call, the, the call is made. We can look at every network packet that comes in and out. Really interesting is I can push um, application and AWS logs to CloudWatch logs, which allows me to do log aggregation um, and, uh, and log display. I can also, with this concept of dedicated hosts, I can stand up a dedicated host for server-bound licenses like the Microsoft servers are, and then if I turn on config recording, every time an instance is loaded onto that server or, or not, I will have a full recording in AWS config to be able to prove or survive an audit to show that I'm within uh, Microsoft license uh, requirements. I mentioned at the beginning another advantage is that, we, is that we can run this in a compliant environment. And so it, it, it's really another session but we have, we have accelerators for compliance for the NIST 800-53 controls, for PCI, for FedRAMP, et cetera, et cetera. And so you can stand that, you can run the quick start that I've been showing you here inside of these sandboxes, and then you get this, you know, this huge leg up on, on having a compliant infrastructure. Okay, and I've got a set of related sessions um, that are all great, and, um, Thank you very much. I hope you've enjoyed this.